Won't you look what the Lord has done? Oh, uh, He touched my body, He touched my mind, He saved me just in time. Oh, I'm gonna praise His name. Oh, each day is just the same. I'm gonna praise Him. Look what the Lord has done. Oh, look what the Lord has done Look what the Lord has done He touched my body He touched my mind He saved me Just in time Oh, I'm gonna praise His name Oh, yeah, each day is just the same I'm gonna praise Him Look what the Lord has done. You didn't have to love me like you did But you did, but you did And I thank you Oh, you didn't have to chase me like you did But you did, but you did And I thank you No, you didn't have to save me like you did But you did, but you did Oh, and I thank you Oh, you didn't have to love me like you did But you did but you did and I thank you yes I thank you yes I thank you yes I thank you yes I thank you oh, oh thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you oh, oh thank you Come on, let's lift up a sound of thankfulness in this room. We enter his gates with thanks, with thanksgiving, with gratefulness in our hearts. And we step into his courts with praise. my father you are my father and I long for you you give me strength 
to carry through My heart is changed Oh, because of you And I lift my voice and sing Oh, I lift my voice and sing I lift my voice Oh, and I lift my voice and sing Oh, and I lift my voice and sing Praise Him, praise Him do that again in my in my life do that again as we just really press in so um you know i was thinking paul keith davis uh, several several years ago so i don't know where he is now but he said you know he was struggling with the bride and the son sons of god thing you know he said it's I'm, I can totally relate to being a son of god he said but the bride thing i'm really having a hard time with and so he said, so what I've decided to do is in the morning, I've decided to take on the bridal posture because that's when he has his intimate time with the Lord. And he said, in the afternoon, I take on the son of God posture and just get, you know, get her done, get the things, do be about my father's business. So I was thinking this morning, I don't know where Steve's heart is going this morning, but uh, th let's just really take on that bridal posture this morning. And just come into that intimate place with the Lord. And there is a word of intimacy that has been released here. Actually, we really started with it in 2016. But uh, I've just noticed between Jeremy and, and Mahesh and all the things that have come out so far, there is that wooing, that calling of the Father to come away with me, to come away with me. And that you are a candidate for that. You, each and every one of us, it doesn't matter what's going on or what's not going on in our lives. There's that, that place that's wooing us in the spirit to come up here, to come away. So just let God love you this morning. Just let him love you as we just stand up together and just worship him. So why don't you grab the hand of somebody next to you. Tell them how amazing they look today. So happy that you're here. If you're streaming with us this morning, we welcome you. We welcome you. All right. Are we ready to pray? Power of agreement this morning, right? Amen. So, Father, we, we do say thank you so much. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you that uh, always that is that echo in the spirit. Come up here. And so, Father, we step in this morning. We step into that place of face-to-face -face with you this morning. We step into that place of love and mercy and grace for us. We step into that place called your glory this morning, God. And, Father, we, just, we do give you our thanks. We surrender our hearts this morning, God. We, we come into that secret place called the garden, Lord, where first love grows and grows and grows. So thank you this morning, Father, that each and every one of us, each and every one can come face to face with you. Each and every one can drink of your goodness, can sit down and eat a good breakfast with you this morning, God. We thank you for that. Lord, we thank you for the angelic uh, realms that you have released in this place. And Father, we just say, let, let your will be done here this morning, God. Let whatever pleases your heart, the intent of your heart, God, we come into alignment with this morning. And Lord, we say we love you. We love you. Today and every day is all about you, all about you, God. And so, Lord, we open up our hearts to you this morning. 
We say, we'll, I, I'll let you love me this morning, God, as I'm just giving back the love that I have for you. And all the saints said, amen. So I, I encourage you, th this area here in the front is a very bridal area. <laughs> just get comfy, okay? Get comfy. You don't have to stand the whole time. You can, many of you I just might want to just come sit or get on your face before the Lord. Shoo. I don't know if you can feel it already, but there is that, that's that wooing presence here today. Settle in, just settle into this. Breathe it in, breathe it in, breathe it in, breathe it in, breathe it in. I was made to be loved by you, created for your joy. who I am and this is what I do this is who I am and this is what I do created to worship to worship you oh this 
is who I am, this is what I do. Yeah, yeah, this is who I am, and this is what I do. And this is who I am, and this is what I do, yeah. I was created to worship, to worship you. what I do, yeah. This is who I am, and this is what I do. This is who I am, and this is what I do. I was created to worship you. Created to worship you. Created to worship you. And I hear the Father's love song over you today. I hear his rejoicing tones singing over you. Oh, I hear his song, I hear his song, his song of love singing over you, surrounding you, the songs of deliverance. Like a shield. And I hear him saying, chose you first you were my desire and I chose you first and I will never leave you I will not forsake you cause I chose you first You are my desire. I chose you first, <laughs> and I will never leave you. I will not forsake you, cause you are mine, and I am yours forever. Give you peace in life and a future with me. And a fashion informed you, fashion informed you into my very own image. When I sing my song of you day and night, night and day, a swirling song of deliverance. I'm releasing the wind, the wind of my passion to blow on your heart. Cause I can see your devotion. Oh, and I know just where you are. Oh, and even if you descend to the lowest 
lowest places and even if you descend to the lowest places and ascend to the highest of hills I'll be there watching over you I'll be there singing over Cause I chose you first You are my desire I chose you first And I will never leave you I will not forsake you Cause you are mine you are mine, you are mine You are mine, and I am yours You are mine, and I am yours You are mine, and I am yours You are mine steal away for a moment or two come and sit a while with me let's open the books together let's read about the mysteries come on and sit down with me Come on and sit down with me. Let's open the book together and read about the mystery. Because there's revelation just waiting for you. Page after page, another chapter of your destiny as we stand here face to face. Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know the secret? Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know the mysteries? Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know the secrets of my heart over you? Because I chose you first. You are my desire. And I chose you first And I will never leave you I will not forsake you You are mine You are mine Ooh. You are mine
want to go? How much do you want to know? How much do you want to see? How much do you want to know? How far do you want to go? How much do you want to see? How far do you want to go? How much do you want to know? How much do you want to see? It's all there for you. It's all there for you. Because oh, in my house, there's many rooms for you. Step through the door. Step through the door. your mind <laughs> and when I look at you <laughs> I see that you've already <laughs> lost your mind That's a good thing. that line leaving thoughts that enslave me behind I'm free standing on the edge of my mind I found a place to unwind <laughs> Knowing it's your heart, Lord, I'm going to find that I'm free. And I'll soar on the wings of an eagle. 
There's no limits, there's no boundaries, nothing's gonna hold me down, cause there's freedom in the spirit of the Lord. Freely move through space and time. <laughs> Revelation has opened these eyes that were blind. And I'm free. Yes, I'm free. And I saw. There's no boundaries, nothing's gonna hold me down. Cause there's freedom in the spirit of the Lord. And I saw the wings of an eagle. To heights that I've never been before. There's no limits, there's no boundaries, nothing's gonna hold me down. There's no limits, there's no boundaries. <laughs> Nothing's gonna hold me down. What? There's no limits. There's no boundaries. Nothing's gonna hold me down. Cause there's freedom in the spirit of the Lord. There's freedom in the spirit of the Thank you. 
and my flesh is falling. My spirit's rising and my flesh is falling. Oh, my spirit's rising and yeah, my flesh is falling. <laughs> yeah, my spirit's rising. My flesh is falling as your glory's shining, as your glory's shining, as your glory's shining, as your glory's shining. Set the invitation before you now to come and sit with me.
Let's turn another page of the mystery. Wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't you like to know? Wouldn't you like to know? Yes. So let me tell you what's on my heart today. In one simple word, it's you. And the lost, and the broke, and the widow. And the poor and the lost and the broken and the widow and the poor. So come on in, let me show you more of my heart. You were worth it all, worth it all, worth it all. Gonna give you access, set you apart. We give you our yes this morning, God. With all that is within us, we give you our yes this morning. Our yes. I just felt like uh, I wanted to just release this word of prophecy over us this morning, just in light of where we've just been this morning. Steve, you're just amazing. You're just amazing. <laughs> Song of Songs, <clears throat> verse 2. I've, I've read this several times. I just feel like it's just something in the atmosphere for now and for probably forever. But <clears throat> it says, Arise, my dearest, hurry, my darling, and come away with me. I have come, as you have asked, to draw you to my heart and lead you out. For now is the time, my beautiful one. This season has changed, and the bondage of your barren winter has en ended, and the season of hiding is over and gone. The rains have soaked the earth and left it bright with blossoming flowers. And the season for singing and pruning the vines has arrived. I hear the cooing of doves in our land, filling all the air with songs to awaken you and guide you forth. Can you not discern the new day of destiny breaking forth all around you? The signs of my purposes and plans are bursting forth. The budding vines of new life are now blooming everywhere. The fragrance of the flowers whisper, there is change in the air. Arise, my love, my beautiful companion, and run with me to the higher place. For now is the time to arise and come with me. For you are my dove, hidden in the split open rock. It was I who took you and hid you up high in the secret stairway of the sky. So now let me see your radiant face and hear your sweet voice. How beautiful your eyes of worship 
and lovely your voice in prayer. You must catch the troubling foxes, those sly little foxes that hinder our relationship, for they raid our budding vineyard of love to, to ruin and I've, what I've planted in you. We will catch them and remove them. We will do it together. So, Father, we just thank you for this season that we're in. We thank you, Father, that we can receive this word now, Lord, since we've stepped out of our minds and our spirits, Lord, our spirits are open. Our eyes see, our ears hear, God. We thank you. We thank you, Father. Seal up what's been done here already this morning, God. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. For we say, worthy, worthy are you. Oh, Lord God. Oh, Lord, our God, our God. Amen. Amen. Why don't you just give somebody a love hug? Patty, you want to come up and receive the offering? Everybody go. Wow, that was so good. Thank you, Lord. Woo, Jesus. Wow. Well, um, God is just so good. That was so beautiful. Just thank you, Steve. Wow. God, we could get lost in that, in God's goodness. So I, I'm... I know everybody's been welcome this morning. I'm just going to take up the offering, so if you can prepare that. Sort of have a strange little thing that the Lord laid on my heart today, but as Sandy was, um, what she just shared there, you know, how the, the, the little foxes that come in and try to steal away what God's doing in our lives, wants to do in our lives, and it's those little foxes, and I felt like the Lord was saying, it's the little thoughts that come in to our mind that try to steal away God's goodness. It's like the enemy wants to make us mistrust him. And so I couldn't get rid of this morning. I've been, I've, I'm driving, I'm sure I'm driving everybody crazy because I'm, I'm sort of been reading about the Hebrew letters and things like that. Today is the ninth and it's the Hebrew letter Tet. And the, the Tet talks about goodness, the goodness of God. And that's what the Lord's really been doing in my life, is that he's been really speaking to me about declaring his goodness over everything. Declaring his goodness over our finances, over sickness, over everything. So I'm going to tell you a quick little, this is the little rabbi story that they tell about the letter Tet. So this, there was a rabbi traveling along, and he had with him a, um, a candle, a rooster, and a donkey. And so he's traveling along, and he goes to a town. He can't find any place to, to um, go to bed that night, or anybody that would take him in. So he goes out into the woods, and he, um, he camps out there, and he's got it, lights his candle, and the candle was so that he could read the word, and the, the, the rooster was so he could wake him up in the morning. That was his alarm clock. And the donkey, of course, for him to travel along. All of a sudden, this big wind comes up, the candle goes out, and then a fox comes along and eats his rooster, and then a lion came along and, and it killed his donkey. So he's just like, but he says, whatever God is doing, it's for my good. And he declared that. Whatever God is doing, it's for my good. And then the next morning, he wakes up and he finds out that a band of robbers had gone into the town that he was going to. And if he would have had the candle lit, they would have seen him. They would have come and killed him. The rooster would have been there, would have crowed, of course, and made them see. And same with the donkey. So whatever God is doing in our lives, that's what I just felt today. I felt that over our whatever we're sowing, that we need to know that God is good. That we need to begin to decree that over our lives, that in everything, God is good. And it's that letter tat, and it actually starts the Hebrew word good. It's the tav, the vav, and the, and the bet, and it means like being at the goodness attached to the house of God. That's the goodness of God that in everything that we do. So the Lord's been really pressing that on my heart. So as you prepare your offering, I just want you to come and bring it and say, God, you are good. 
you are good. Even when there's lack, God, you are good because it's in that that we are releasing the goodness of God. We're releasing the decree of the Lord over our lives that whatever he's doing, he is good. And I just really feel like we are going to see a shift. We are going to see those little foxes that have come in and tried to make us, oh God, are you going to take care of me? Oh God, are you going to, because it says that no, um, they will lack nothing. That, That those that seek the Lord will lack no good thing. So God wants the goodness for us. He wants us to be blessed and to prosper. So as I pray, just prepare And I want you to come up and just bring your offering. And I just really want it to be a decree of God, you are so good. Declare it in everything that we do. So, Father, we thank you, God. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, God, that we dwell and we, we are just wrapped around with your goodness, God. That in everything, Father, you are so good. And we speak it into our circumstance. We speak it into our lives. We speak it to those around us, God. We declare it over ourselves, God, your goodness, Lord. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So come and bring your offering. Woo! Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the rabbi. <laughs> so, yeah, Rabbi Patty, yeah, right? <laughs> Amen. So I just want to introduce our pastor, Darren. Woohoo! God is good. God is good. That was a great word, Patty. Such a great word. Awesome, awesome, awesome. How's everyone doing this morning? You doing good? <laughs> I feel good. I can do that. I would. So good. Oh my goodness, this, this has been a lot of fun. How many of you guys enjoyed Jeremy Nelson? Yeah, awesome, awesome. How many of you guys enjoyed uh, Papa Mahesh last night? Wasn't that, inc- wasn't that fantastic? Oh my goodness. I want to try preaching like that, actually. From, you know, just, just start sitting behind a desk and just, just start taking my time. You know, and so we'll, we'll try that. You shouldn't try to be other people. Um, but, but sometimes it's fun. To try to be other people. Anyways, um, listen, you're in for you're in for such a treat. I I, I like um, I don't know about you. I, like I don't even necessarily feel tired this morning. And, like and, like, and if you don't, if you should feel tired this morning, but there's something in you that just feels alive, alert, awake, and you're like, what what is that? Like and like my face feels a little tired, but my spirit feels just alive, <laughs> uh, uh, alive, alert, and awake. Like if if, if you feel that, I'll, I'll tell you what that is. It's you're in Bonnie Shabda's atmosphere. Yeah. That, that's, it, it's, it's better than caffeine, it's better than, than like, there's just this, there's just this, uh, this energy, this vitality, this, like, this flourishing, this spirit of awakening that, 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 that Bonnie uh, uh, carries, and so th- this is going to be, this is going to be incredible, and, 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 um, and so let's do this. Uh, on, on, on the count of three, let's just stand to our feet and just worship Jesus and his yeah. grace as it's being expressed um, through the Shabdas and through Bonnie. And then when she comes up, let's just, let's, just, let's just bless her and then just release her. Is that good? All right. One, two, three. Come on. Jesus! Hey! Jesus! Come on, lift them a shout to the Lord. Jesus! Hey! Jesus! All right, stretch out your hands. Stretch out your hands towards the television set. Come on. Father, we honor your daughter. Oh, Lord. This, 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 we honor royalty oh, in the house. Lord. Oh, Lord. Father, we thank you that you downloaded into her spirit a recipe. And that you have equipped her with the ingredients through life experience. Father, that you have anointed her. You've been slow cooking something in her. (laughs) That we receive with joy and with glad hearts. 
Father, we thank you that Bonnie is like a chef in the spirit. She's always tasting what she's mixing. She's always <laughs> tasting what, what she's cooking. She, she's, she's, she's a good chef. She knows that she's, she's got the acidity right and the saltiness <laughs> right. And she's not, she's not, um, she's not, uh, 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 this is not fast food. <laughs> She takes her time and she serves Jesus it with pride. Lord. And we receive it with joy. Father, we receive your daughter today. Ah. In Jesus' name, everybody Woo. said amen. 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 All right. Ah. Okay, so all together say, bon appetit. <laughs> as long as it's not a recipe for disaster and it's not a pot of crock, right? <laughs> now, hello, family. It's wonderful to be present physically as we are always present together in the spirit realm. In the realm of the spirit, we are always in the same place together. Because as you know, Jesus has created a new race of human beings. And we are not as we shall be, but we are partially now. The thing that's lacking, the only thing that's lacking, say the only thing, the only thing. is our indestructible body that we will be clothed with. There is nothing else lacking for our eternal state with our eternal high priest. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And we should not fear anything. And we need one another to be courageous. And we need to encourage one another daily not to be afraid of anything this world has to offer. Last night, during the amazing conversation with the Lord, he reminded me of his words to Jeremiah when Jeremiah was rather bemoaning the sad state of affairs in his own life and his nation. And the Lord said to him, as he, you know, Jeremiah had recounted all of this litany of genuinely things like, you know, the fox eating the chicken and the lion eating the donkey and all of those kind of things. And the Lord said, if the footmen wear you out, what will you do when the horsemen come? Come on. All the more, it is time that we recognize in one another and in ourselves and in the church, Christ in us. And not the future hope, but existential now being indwelled by him who is the ruler of the cosmos by him who has kept nothing back for himself but freely shares himself fully with us and the recognition that each of us fully engaging and allowing him to be himself in and through us, then we fit together as his living body in the earth. And not one member is irrelevant or more or less crucial, vital. Say vital. vital. Tap your neighbor and say, you're vital. You're vital. So, very quickly, uh, one of our Power in the Word CDs, it's scripture and music. This one is called Enthroned. It literally came out of a physical appearance of an angel. Uh, uh, actually, in this particular case, he was a warring angel that was engaged in the Revolutionary War at the time of the birthing of a new idea, a new nation called America. And America is unique, and don't let anybody tell you that it's not. 
every nation is unique. The Bible is filled with the revelation of the end of the age when the nations individually say nations. God views nations as he views cities as individuals, as persons. And everyone has its unique language, its cultures, its foods, its recipe to bring to God's big hole. And at the end of the age, individuals will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Nations as nations will be judged as nations concerning their stewardship of their spiritual destiny. And the whole idea of globalism is an idea from the Antichrist to homogenize the otherwise creation and intention of our Father. That's for free. But I'll tell you something. That idea is at the heart and root of probably 70% of the new political ideas continually rising in the world creating a false religion, a new different kind of morality that values creation, which we should, but it is creation over the center, the, 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 the crowning glory of creation, which is human beings. And when you have radical movements saying that you're immoral if you don't respect trees and you're moral if you give respect to a woman's uh, right to murder her unborn child, do you see that it is not quite... Hey, listen, in this location, strategically, spiritually, priests of God, in these kind of things, there should be a rousing amen on that one because you're making a statement and a stand in a region where these spiritual forces have taken root to export this false religion, and it's many faceted, to export these ideas. It's like a strong, it's one of the reasons that you are so strategic. It's one of the reasons that for the last 40 years, maybe even 100, the significant spokespersons of God have prophesied a particular dynamic destiny for the church, for a nation, for the nations coming from this region. And it's happening. It's happening. I'm going to tell you something. The counterfeiter has already, thank God, made this a gateway. So I'm just telling you, he did the groundwork. Glory, hallelujah. Now it's time for the church to recognize to arise, to step in. And every part, every joint ligament, every member is vital. And if you're not from this area, this absolutely applies to you. Anyway, enthroned when God reigned, it came from a visitation of an angel. And the bottom line was what Patty shared with us about making God king in your region, in your jurisdiction, in your family, in your space through praise. God is enthroned upon the praises of his people. So the angel said to Pastor Mahesh, how big is your chair? In other words, how big are you making his throne? Right. I always say if he'd said that to me, I would realize, okay, all right, treadmill, the diet, I'm finally, you know, asking me about how big my chair went. Never mind. So enthroned, I am going to give this to that young man right there on the aisle. Yes, you, sir. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What's your name? Jaden. Huh? Jaden. Hi, Jaden. Praise the Lord. How old are you? 16. 16 years old. I'm going to give you something else, too. I'm going to give you our book, Storm Warrior. All right? Storm Warrior. <laughs> It'll bless you. Praise the Lord. Uh, enough said about all of that. But I give you this with a gift, as a gift, with a blessing, and with a release. 
for the anointing in your life, not to put pressure on you, not to bind you up in any kind of religious or humanistic preconceptions, but as a recognition of the gift that you are to our generation and a prayer that you will find him as he is, and in finding him as he is, you will recognize him in you and who you are. So we bless you, son. God bless you. Yeah. And I would like to see that gentleman right there with the beard. That, yeah, yeah, you. Now, am I correct that you got blasted last night? Yes, I got blasted. And you were wearing like the throwback to when I was, you know, a little younger wearing that, you were wearing that thing that was a threat. Listen, I should have kept a bunch of the clothes that I owned in the 70s and 80s. You, you, you were in that poet. Yeah, am I, am I correct? You, yeah, the, the poet thing. So I, what's your name? Jeff. Jeff, hey Jeff, praise the Lord. Um, I'm gonna ask you to do something. Did you bring a bunch of junk with you like a backpack or anything like that or it's just you? Oh, fantastic. See, <laughs> what he carries is in him. <laughs> I may give you this little gift, our book, Getting to Know the Holy Spirit. The introduction was written by a very famous musician who has now become the father of bluegrass to a new generation, Ricky Skaggs. We call him Uncle Ricky. He's a good, close friend of ours. Well, Uncle Ricky was a good old Baptist boy. And Mahesh invited him to Nigeria to do a pastor's get-together, a uh, teaching seminar for pastors there. And they like country music, so it made sense to bring Uncle Ricky along to do some country music, some bluegrass type, you know, things like that. And... During the lab part of the seminar, after Mahesh had talked about um, carrying the commission of signs and wonders, he called Uncle Ricky up to the front of the stage. There was a little nine-year-old girl named Adebolo who had been born without eyes that was present. And Mahesh called her up. And he said, Uncle Ricky, watch Jesus. And he laid hands on this little girl, and right there in front of Uncle Ricky and God and everybody, <laughs> the little girl got eyes. So needless to say, Uncle Ricky became a tongue-talking fanatic. <laughs> and has been so ever since. But Uncle Ricky wrote the introduction to this book. And as a poet, from a poet to a poet, we bless the music. We bless the lyric. We bless the melody. We bless the connections. And we bless you and recognize that this is the hour for beauty and for glory in the sons of God. Praise the Lord, Jeff. Praise the Lord. So yeah. And I am going to ask you, are you going to be in the service? I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to go and move that turquoise book and sit yourself right down there for God reasons without being too mysterious. Um, this one is... Uh, of uh, the, the first of a series that was web hosted that was on women in leadership. And I was asked to do the introduction one. And um, it's called Presence Empowered, a Woman's Key to Leadership. And I made a comment, it's not a set of rules, it's not a revolt. It's not even a revolution, it's a relationship, duh. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to give this as a gift, Linda Hood, why not? Yeah. Believe it or not, we have known one another for about 40 years now. Did you have the number exactly? 
44. Oh, Dale. He married at 44 years of age. So Mahesh and I, in our church, I, I was not, ma- You're not married. I was not married to him then. And you were our resident chef. And then this former Catholic nun came along. Never the same. Never the same. They got blessed, baptized in the Holy Ghost. God put them together. And it's been an adventure ever since. Praise the Lord. So yeah, we served together for a number of years in the first church that we were assigned to under Derek out there in a place called Level Land. Texas, for a reason. (laughs) Praise the Lord. It's so good to see you guys. We love you so much. Praise the Lord. Amen. Stay strategic alliances. For real. We will give you a free gift called Your Year of Increase. It's a prophetic word that came to us out of the watch at the beginning of 2019. And um, uh, during the book signing or at the book table, there's a a sheet you can sign up if you would like to get that message. Um, And in that context, uh, the Lord spoke to me, completely surprised me at the beginning of this year. And it happened when a friend of mine, very close friend of mine who lives in another city, who... um, took it upon herself to learn to paint in watercolors. And she was not an artist uh, by craft, but has always possessed that creative spirit. And so she took it upon herself to, uh, to learn to water paint, watercolor. And um, her particular uh, form it is to paint the old icons, but put new faces in them. Yeah. Say new faces. On some old things. Say new. Old. Remember what Jesus said about every scribe who is faithful. Now that was very important. Because the scribes were the ones who had the job of explicitly copying the word. And if they made a little bobble, you couldn't just use white out or, you know, press a button for delete. You had to start over in writing those scrolls. But he said that every faithful scribe draws out of his treasure old and new. Say, that's what revival looks like. Say it again. That particular revelation and phrase is emphasized in Leviticus concerning the priesthood. And you will find it repeated again in places like Song of Solomon. And then you will find Jesus saying to his followers, you will be drawing out treasures of old and new together. Praise the Lord. We like to talk about a lot of new, 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 new. Listen, new rests in the old, the former, the original, if you will, the foundational, the seasoned. So, say new and old. So, I had been traveling at the turn of the year, and it was the Sunday after the first of the year, and when I got home, there was a package on my table, and I saw that it was from my friend, and my heart said, oh, I hope she painted something for me. And I was rushing to get to church, it's 11-11, by the way. I like numbers. Isaiah 11-11. Anybody know what it says? 
I will set my hand again the second time, says the Lord, to recover the remnant of my people. We are in a time of the recovery of the original intent of the Father's heart of God, but it looks a little newer than our former ideas. So we're going out of our mind. Praise the Lord. And you know what? I just want to say to you, Steve Swanson, once again, thank you is not enough for the life lived in devotional service and sacrificial love to your king and ours every day, every hour, that when you come, you open his mouth and he not only sings to us, but he forms us. And we wanna thank you for your secret life. So you said some stuff today. You said some stuff today. Um, so I, 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 as I was rushing past the table to go to church, the Lord said, open that box because when you open it, I'm going to give you a word for the year. Now, that may happen to you guys, but I'm just not that. And so I stopped and opened the box. And sure enough, as I began to pull out the gift that was in it, Peggy, my friend, had, water, had painted a watercolor for me of the Magi. You know who the Magi, yep. right? We call it the three wise men. Well, I don't know. There may have been 20 or 30 of them. But this is, this is the picture that she painted for me. And as this thing emerged from the box, the word of the Lord fell on me like a river, each one bearing a noble gift. Wisdom, like a hammer, but soft. You know, I had no idea that people who use hammers understand that there really is such a thing as a soft hammer. And then one of our senior watchman leaders, one of the elders in our church, after I delivered this word, he told me about his job as a bicycle repairman. When someone brought a very expensive bicycle in and the steering mechanism had gone out on this thing, making the entire thing useless. And he had to get into the steering mechanism. He had to open it in order to fix the problem. But it had a unique kind of pin. And anything other than a soft hammer would have broken or, you know, deformed the pin and the bicycle would never have been usable again. But with a soft hammer, he was able to open that thing and fix it. Wisdom, like a hammer, but soft. And I will say to you that there are many steering mechanisms in people's lives, in our national and local politics, which, by the way, I believe that in this region you guys are in a run up to a new election. It's more important than ever that you be engaged as one calling on heaven into earth. And more than that, to be open, some of which may surprise you. But it's time for strategic alliances. And God is doing something. And he's inviting us to fully participate. So we pray, Lord, together as one. We make intercession as touching earth for heaven, for this region in the upcoming elections. And we pray that you would give us leaders such that it would be to your glory to give us, your church, your kingdom, the victory through them. That you would bring visitation on hearts and minds that are currently darkened. That you would bring courage on hearts and minds that are hidden but enlightened. Yes. 
and put them in places of influence and power. And at the same time, say, Lord Jesus, I also volunteer. Write that down. Make sure you list every name. You can figure that out. So, wisdom, say wisdom. And one of the things I loved about it is after the picture came out, do you see how it looks like they're emerging out of darkness into light? Yeah. Wisdom, like a hammer but soft. He said, grace. Say grace. grace. And immediately he said, with unusual physical miracles. Not just some airy fairy, be nice to people. But it is the demonstration of the Son of God present to heal, to recover, to reclaim, to reconcile. Not in a politically correct way, not in a homogenization, not in global politics but literally bringing things back into their original ordination of harmony and symphony so that every piece is fitted and properly doing its function for the whole. Praise the Lord. And he said, in 2019, it will be the beginning of the reward of faith exercised in previous seasons. Say wisdom, wisdom. Grace, grace, faith, faith. And, its and its reward. Beginning, Beginning. Now. Now. now, in the rise, in the rise. Of, the of the priesthood. The letter to the Hebrews speaks in a concentrated way about the priesthood. Now, why do you reckon that is? Because from the influence of knowing the old and then encountering the new true fulfillment in Christ, it was a bringing together the understanding from the old in order to cast light on the reality of the new. Right? So it speaks of Jesus again and again and again as the high priest. But the implication is it is speaking to the sons, the daughters, the children, the heirs, all of those called into service with him as the high priest. And of course, the Old Testament, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers is explicit and it goes on and on and on about the priesthood. But it was a shadow of who we are now. So, in brief, I'll just read you a couple of scriptures. Aaron. Who's our Aaron? Who is our Aaron now? Does anybody know? Ah, Jesus. Yes, you can say that with confidence. Jesus is our high priest. Can you say that? Psalm 133 talks about the anointing that is on the head Jesus is the head of the body, right? And then it's flowing down, and it says flows into every single part all the way down to the edges of the robe of the high priest. It's a picture of us being anointed. You have an anointing from the Holy One. And the old things show us the unique characteristic, the holiness, the sanctity, the consecration, the vital reality of these anointed ones called the priesthood. We could go there. But so that's why Hebrews emphasizes Jesus as a high priest because it's speaking to us as the priesthood. It's not setting him aside as his own, uh, on his own, up there somewhere. No, the whole idea is to recognize that we have been called into this priesthood and now it is fully functioning way beyond how it functioned in the old. So, towards the end of Exodus. 
Aaron, now who's our Aaron? Good. Shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goes into the holy place. When did Jesus go into the holy place? Come on. Come on. Wasn't on the cross. And it wasn't when he rose again. Hey! When he ascended. And he took into heaven, into the cosmic sanctuary, the sacrifice, the offering, the gift of his blood. (laughs) Cleansed the heavenly sanctuary because there had been a revolt there. The holy things had been defiled, believe it or not. And the understanding of the old is that the presence of anything short of the perfection of God would had a radioactive nature to it and it would drive out that abiding of the Shekinah, the third person of the Godhead. Because light and darkness do not dwell together. A little light comes in, the darkness is gone. Blood, say the blood. And they understood all of those sacrifices, all of the blood. It was, to, it was to continually cleanse and sanctify God's dwelling place in the earth that the Shekinah, the living, abiding, manifest presence of the person of God would be continually in the midst of his people and visible to the nations. Marching before them, we read, I read last night during the offering, the cloud would go three days in advance to find the resting place, and then all the people would come behind. Well, the priests were the ones that were bearing the ark and all of the implements, and they would go with the cloud moving, and then they would quickly, when the cloud started marking the spot, they would quickly go to work and set up the tabernacle and bring in all the stuff and put it in order and put the fire on the altars and the incense, so on and so forth, and the Shekinah would and rest there and abide. And all of the rest of the people would be organized around that dynamic. That's a picture of God's intention for the nations with the church in the middle. And the tent of every house open towards looking at what is happening in the church and ordering their lives from the manifest presence. Are you with me? So, Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goes into the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. Hebrews says he ever lives to make intercession for us. That, that's the new of this old. Oh, there's so much more there. You shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Tumen, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. And when we say judgment, understand, we aren't just talking about you in trouble for your sins. And now Jesus has taken that judgment. He has. But it is much bigger than that. It's talking about the mind that understands justice to discern between good and evil between dark and light, between life and death. That's what judgment is. And let me tell you this. Love has judgment. Discernment. Wisdom. Okay. Going a little forward. Few, few, few verses forward. And for Aaron's sons, who are the sons? Give me a reference. One scripture reference from the New, New Testament. Sons. I don't care about chapter and verse. That doesn't matter. Say the thing. 
Now, beloved, we are the sons of God. Give me another one. Boom, those who are led by the Spirit. Remember the cloud? The priesthood? Aaron's sons? As many as are led? And it's not, it, 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 it's not a litmus test. It's a declaration that you, because you are led by the Spirit of God, are the priesthood under the high priest. Oh, Jesus. I know I always look like I'm mad. I'm, I'm happy inside. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. So the whole world sitting in darkness has one place to direct its eyes to see light, to understand judgment and justice. That's to the church. The New Testament calls the church the ground and pillar of truth. Don't be bad mouthed in the church. Because there's somebody who takes it personal when you start talking about his woman. All right. And for Aaron's sons, you shall make coats. John's revelation. All these people that have been brought into relationship to the lamb lying on the throne are wearing white linen. The righteousness of Christ, the righteous acts of the saints, this priesthood. These were linen. You shall make coats. You shall make for them sashes. Having your Ephesians. Belt, girt about with. Come on. Headdresses. You shall make for them for glory and for beauty. Say for glory and for beauty. Say it again. I want you to use your priestly imagination and look around this room and recognize you're not just looking at normal human beings that had a bad hair day. Really. Look around for a moment because everyone in this room, and if you're in this room or listening to this message and you have never received your ordination as a human being by being consecrated into God through faith in Jesus Christ, this is your invitation. You have a calling on your life. Hallelujah. Say for glory and for beauty. And you shall put them upon Aaron, your brother. <sighs> Remember what I said? The one who sits there is a man. He's one of us. Our brother. And upon his sons with him. We are seated where? With him. With him. Say with him. You got to get out of your mind for this because this is a reality. I know you're sitting in a chair in the sanctuary at SRC in Seattle, but you are also seated right now, right there, there with him as well. And it has implications. This is what revival looks like. And you shall anoint them. Guess what they were anointed with first and what happened before the anointing? All of the blood all of the blood sacrifices. And then from the blood sacrifices, each one would be touched, daubed, smeared with blood on the right ear, the right thumb, and the right big toe. And then they would be anointed. It's a sign that the blood continually cleansing us, continually sets us apart in consecration that the anointing might perpetually rest on us, the third person of the Godhead. So this is why the cross is never in the rear view mirror. Why the work of the cross is exactly, it's for the earth. 
and it is for us as long as we have mortal flesh. Does any of this, right? It's so simple. It is so simple. Old and new have kissed one another, and we have been made the recipients of this treasure. Anoint them, consecrate them, sanctify them, that they may minister to me in the priest's office. And it goes on about covering their nakedness and various other things. Say holy. Holy. Look at the priest sitting next to you. Say holy. So 2019, with that painting of beauty and glory, the Lord said this is the year. Father, Son, and Spirit uniquely are visiting his people, each bearing a noble gift. (laughs) Receive from the Lord this year the beginning of impartation of divine wisdom, of supernatural grace with miracles, and the rewards of your faith. And it's not just ending at the end of the year. (laughs) But I say to you, this is the word of the Lord. The priesthood is rising. Hallelujah. Jesus. You've waited a long time for this. You have waited and waited to see the glory. To see the glory of God. You have prayed and prayed and prayed believing. Like Anna in the temple. You said, I'm not going away, Lord, until I see what I've seen. May the reward of your faith come and fill your hands. So that's for free. How many times have we heard about foxes in the last 24 hours? We are, huh? Fox, 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 fox. Did you get it? He sang about foxes. She pre- uh, read scriptures about foxes. She gave a little rab- rabbinical thing about foxes. I read a scripture last night from the whole foxes context of Song of Solomon. You ready for this? Swanson, you're going to love this if you haven't seen it already. Oh, we're tracking. Thursday. Say Thursday. Thursday. I am reading the headline from the Jerusalem Post. Foxes seen walking near the Western Wall fulfilling biblical promise. According to the biblical prophecy, Now that the barren temple has become a walking ground for foxes, so it will be rebuilt. (laughs) Say old and new. new. I am declaring to you today the rising of the tabernacle of David. The true spiritual tabernacle in the earth that is the community of his priests with the abiding manifest presence of the living God with us. And Derek always used to say, if you want to know what's happening in the church, take a look at the natural events in Israel. (laughs) And of course, the foxes bring us directly to the bride-bridegroom relationship where he says, catch the ones that would otherwise spoil the vine. So, the article says, as the Jewish world is counting the days to the ninth of Av, Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is the memorial of the greatest day of mourning for the Jewish people, because historically, 
again and again in different generations, that day Israel experienced its greatest destruction from its enemies, including the tearing down of the temple and a number of other things, all the way up and into the Holocaust. God still has a calendar. The date on which Jews mourned the destruction of the two temples in Jerusalem following its destruction by the Romans, foxes have been spotted walking near the Western Wall. It is written in the Book of Lamentations, 518, which is read on Tisha B'Av, that Mount Zion, where the temple stood, will be so desolate that, now I'm quoting from scripture, foxes will walk upon it. People, I can't, I, I can't, I don't understand why you're sitting in your seat right now. <laughs> we ask for eyes to see and ears to hear, or eyes to hear and ears to see, I don't care. <laughs> the understanding, according to the Talmud, the Talmud, of course, was written in the Babylonian exile. In the tractate Makot 24b is that if the prophecies of the destruction have been fulfilled, so will be the ones by the prophet Zechariah about the temple being rebuilt. Your eyes. The rising. The rising. The rising. Praise the Lord. So, I'm going to read some notes that I made about Seattle. <laughs> and not just Seattle, but this particular gathering, this convocation, and those of you who are hearing this word later, now, wherever you are, and for all of us here together, applies to me, applies to me and my region, my jurisdiction, but uh, applies to all of us. Yeah. But I'm going to just read it to you because this was a quickening from the Lord. First note that I made for myself was in my own mind back to a, an author who has done some uh, work in the area of historical sociology about the unique phenomenon of the rise of Christianity and how in the world it went from where it started to basically reforming for a time, all of Western culture and influencing the wider globe more than anything else. And he said, how is this possible? And he's done a number of studies, some, some books that are very interesting. His name is Rodney Stark. He's not a believer. Um, his most recent one, let me just say this. One of the things that he emphasizes is that the rise, Darren, this is for you, the rise of Christianity was because even though we think of it as being, oh, in these little tiny little rural places, that is not true. It came into the urban concentrations. And it entered and made light and darkness because in those urban settings, there was so much injustice, deprivation, chaos, violence, and people being crammed together in that setting. Hey, that's an encouraging word. That's an encouraging word. And Darren, I know you, you're on it. You got it. It's a reinforcement of a yes to you. And I call heaven to witness and make real the promise God gave you the day you laid everything down and turned around in the face of your father out there in the nations and said yes to taking up a mantle that at that moment was the sacrifice of a life and the world. And I'm going to tell you, you will gain everything. Hallelujah. 
in the land, say the land, land. Genesis. Um, There is no true collection of stories about Isaac. (laughs) Lots of stuff about Abraham, tons of stuff about Jacob, all kinds of details on Joseph's story, stuff about David, all kinds of stuff. But Isaac is just sort of this little... I mean, there are a couple of really cool things that we emphasize, the way he got his wife and, you know, some stuff like that. But essentially, as the main connector point to the fulfillment of everything God had promised for the generations in perpetuity, Isaac is hardly mentioned. Virtually nowhere does Isaac appear in a tale where as a distinct individual, he's the central character. Unlike Jacob, Joseph, Isaac never directly receives his father's blessing. Talking about in scripture, right? What's written down there for a reason. This is bestowed by God directly. And one gets the impression that even Abraham doesn't deal with his son as an individual. But more sees him as the bridge, as the connector point to what God has said. See the stars? See the sand? Your descendants will be like this. This is not surprising given Isaac's function in his father's life. You have a priestly function. And it's not about you. It's that we be clothed in glory and beauty as his priests, that he be manifest in the earth. And his wisdom, his grace and miracles, and the reward coming on his people, making the nations jealous, will be demonstrated. His main purpose is simply to remain in the land. It's almost as if Abraham, the man who lives in the shadow of sacred trees and plants one in the person of his son. Isaac is forbidden to go beyond the borders of Canaan, the land that is promised. This is speaking to us, friends. It's not speaking to us about religious regulations, but it is speaking to us about fully awakening to the vital importance of us becoming who we are in him and that we remain rooted and not distracted, drawn away or diluted or deluded by the world's way and thinking. Forbidden to go beyond the borders of Canaan. Say renew. Renew. Say revive us again. again. So even in his death, so seemingly out of place, (laughs) it occurs after Jacob has returned home from his wanderings. Only when it is assured that there will be continuity in the land, Isaac is allowed to die. despite the fact that as a result of the text, it must leave him blind and dying for 20 years. <laughs> what am I saying? Scripture says the man, became, he sowed, he remained in the land and sowed in the time of famine. God, I pray you would give us understanding. I'm talking about the awakening and recognition of the vital, the vital nature of the priesthood being functioning in its place in our generation. He sowed in a time of famine, and in the same year, he increased a hundredfold. And it says, the man became great and went on, went on becoming greater until he was exceedingly great. 
Karabas shokurianda kaliaba. Brebe shoriande de la kuriatara. He was the stabilizer and transmitter of Abraham's blessing. His faith and obedience, Darren, made exponential growth of Abraham's estate possible. Father, not my will, yours. In earth as in heaven. Stay the course. Fully awaken. Because there are functions of your vitality that are now being called into operation by the anointing to paint our world and reclaim it for the one who created it. Note the cycles of Isaac's blessed life. Say suddenly. suddenly. We love fast food. <laughs> Note the cycles of Isaac's blessed life. He was 40 before he was married. He was 60 when his barren wife finally gave birth to an heir. And he was 80 and going blind when his sons came of age to inherit. These are my notes. He is deceived by his wife, and inadvertently, in God's plan through the woman we have seen, here's directly from the Lord herself. If you read her prayer at the birth of her sons, she understands what it is to be while Isaac hasn't a clue, but he has to be alive possibly would have resisted because he favored the son that God didn't favor because they were both men given to the census, to their appetites, Esau and Isaac both. And there's a lot of about, you know, I just want to eat and die. That phrase, when Esau said that to Jacob, it was literally in the Hebrew, in that custom, it was a legal transference. It wasn't just idle words. He literally said, here, you can have it, give me that pot of stew. It was a legal transference. So everybody says, oh, Jacob, big cheater. That firstborn that had the father's favor on him gave it away gladly. And then you see Isaac at the end of his life is all he wants is just that savory food that Esau makes, going to eat and die. So you know, never mind. I won't belabor the point, but mama got it. And she understood where the anointing was. And she went for it, and she put her life at risk. She said, listen, he said, Mama, I can't do this. Dad might curse me. She said, listen, let the curse come on me. You do what I tell you. She understood the plan of God. I, I hope there's something in this for you guys. Um, blind and on his deathbed when Jacob, as the heir, returns home from his wandering, and only when it is assured there will be continuity in the land is he allowed to die. For Jacob must return before Isaac is released, and the blessing cycle, say the blessing cycle, cycle. will continue. Say it, you can say that. Put your hands on yourself, say the blessing cycle cycle. will continue continue. in me, me. through me, me. to me, me. to a next generation. I declare, I I decree, decree. the blessing cycle cycle. will continue continue. to me, me. in me, me. through me, me. to a next generation. Hallelujah. 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 And then there's one other little postscript that I, I, I would like to add about Jacob. And that is that, in effect, his brother put a curse, Esau put a curse on Jacob's name, which will only be removed 20 years later. The name means he has sneaked or cheated me, and that's what Esau said, even though Esau was actually the wrongdoer. There is something happening right now in the spirit where God is cleansing some folks of betrayals, where genuine injustices have been done or are being done to you. And God is releasing you from the soul ties on that thing because it's a distraction. 
and it's a potential hole through which his virtue will continue to drain and take your attention and your resources. So in the name of Jesus, we decree the blood of Jesus that is speaking better things than this and release you from every soul tie regarding every betrayal. Kibara, shokuriata. It includes cursed words, curse, words of cursing, uh, words of rejection spoken against you by loved ones, by those in authority around you, over you, by you, to yourself in Jesus' name. We release you in the name of Jesus. You are consecrated, sanctified through the blood of Jesus and anointed as the habitation of the living God to fulfill his purpose. No more hee-haw. Look at your neighbor and say hee-haw. <laughs> Gloom, despair, and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If I don't have bad luck, I've got no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> Look at your neighbor say, no more he -haw. <laughs> Jeremiah. If the footmen wear you out, what are you going to do when the horsemen come? There's deliverance from depression right now. There's also deliverance from cycles of addiction right now. There are three situations in here who have a loved one or a child that is incarcerated. Stand up really quickly. Maybe more than three. I see three, four. God is doing something right now in relation to this, in relation to these words spoken. You don't got to get out of your mind. Don't figure it out. Just stand as the priest and say amen. amen. Make this declaration over that person. The blessing cycle, the blessing cycle. Will, continue. will continue. The blessing cycle, the blessing cycle. Will, continue. will continue. And now in the name of Jesus... I decree, I decree the anointing, the, anointing, the manifest presence manifest of the person of God, person of God breaks, these breaks these chains. Amen. Amen. So, 20 years later, Jacob now has been enriched beyond his wildest imagination. But he got it by serving, servitude, and being cheated himself. And some people say, well, you know, he deserved it because he did it. Not necessarily. But God was up to something in all of those dealings. And finally, when Jacob is returning to the land where God had said, this land. Remember last night from Song of Solomon, let's go and find the place where you are and there I will give you my love. There's a place of inheritance for us. And it has to do with God's perfect timing and strategic alliances and what he is doing in the wider way. And we find ourselves at a crossroads in the epicenter of God's history. <laughs> and we need everybody fully engaged. Everybody fully engaged. Come on. So he's coming back. And he has faced down all kinds of opposition. And you think, well, glory, hallelujah. Now, the rewards of his faith coming to him. And he is terrified because the last time he saw his brother, his brother made an oath to kill him the next time he saw him. And Jacob comes 
to the river at night. And he does what every wise man would do. He sends the women and children ahead of him first. <laughs> yeah. Remember Mahesh last night? They were rioting, trying to burn down our town. I sent Bonnie. <laughs> the Lord is present. Jesus, you are so good. You are awesome, God. And there in that moment, Scripture emphasizes that he's left alone. And it throws us back to the night that Abraham is visited by the manifest person of God in the flaming torch, and they walk between the pieces. And God cuts the covenant, and as he's cutting the covenant, he's proclaiming himself. He's proclaiming his name to Abraham. And in thick terror and darkness, it's a very intense description in the Hebrew of what Abraham, he was in that moment psychologically and physiologically in a moment of a concentrated 430 years of abject slavery and abuse and poverty that his heirs were going to come into in Egypt. And as he walked with God in between those bloody pieces laid out, there was a divine intercession and experience, a prophetic dynamic that was being worked out between them. And now we see a kind of similar thing repeated as Jacob is coming back. Isaac is still alive. And he's coming back into the place where God said, the land on which you're lying, I'm going to give it to you. Never say never. The first year that we moved to Charlotte, which was initiated by the relocation of our spiritual father and mentor whom we serve, Derek, moving his residence to Jerusalem. And by the way, in his last days in Jerusalem, Derek could look out of his front window and he would be looking at the spot that is now the American Embassy. <laughs> Your prayers matter. You're creating the future realities. Anyway, so we were invited to Charlotte, and I do mean invited. 40 of the local senior pastors heard we might be in transition, sent us a signed letter asking us to move to Charlotte, plant a church, open our ministry that we were needed there. For us, at where we were at in our lives, that was the calling card of God. There was nothing else to be considered. We weren't looking at, you know, let's move to Charlotte, but we understood that was God saying, this is where I'm planting you for lots of reasons, but anyway, we didn't know at the time half of what God was up to. Remember the blessing cycle in Isaac's life? It took a while. It took a while. So, I'm distracting myself. <sighs> Say there. there. I will give you my love. And as Jacob is returning to the there place, he's returning to the place that some 14, 15, 17, maybe 20 years before, he had fled. And he found himself alone at night in the darkness running for his life with nothing but a stone to lay his head on. And he laid down and he dreamt and he saw something. Yeah. That there, say there. there. There was a ladder. 
there was a stairway. Steve sang about it today. Sandy read about it today. There was a stairway and the angels were going up from Jacob into the heavens and descending back to him in that place. And he awoke and he said, this is the gate of heaven, I didn't know it. (laughs) Duh. (laughs) Now he's back to the there. Look at your neighbor and say, in this season, there is a returning to the there. The X marks the spot in the time and space of your destiny and mine. Angels are attending. Heaven is open. You are vital to the fulfillment and exponential growth of the Father's inheritance. (laughs) Oh, Lord. And it says that a man wrestled with him just when Jacob thought, you know, listen, he had out of the darkness comes this man. And he is fighting for his life. He probably, his first thing is, this is Esau. He's come to kill me. He was always bigger than I was. And now he's going to take his vengeance. And Jacob is wrestling for his life in the darkness. Some of you feel like that now. I want to tell you something. It ain't the devil. Scripture says God hides himself in the thick darkness. There are some people that want to just cry right now because it's suddenly like, are you kidding me? God would do this to me? And some of you are like, I am so relieved (laughs) to know that this is actually God because now I can trust and have assurance as to how this deal is going to work out. And finally, as the light begins to dawn, he sees the man. And he's like, that's not my brother. And he says, what's your name? And the man says, what's your name? <laughs> and he says, I'm a cheater. He says, no, you're not. You're Israel. Beloved of God. You got something to prophesy? I know we've been working you to pieces to the bone. But you know, always in these atmospheres, you can say and do anything or nothing. God changed his name in that wrestling with the dawning, with the awakening. And he let Jacob know who he really was. Beloved of God. Ordained. Consecrated. Sanctified. Do you know who that man was that wrestled with him? When an angel, when Gabriel or Moroni. <laughs> was pre-incarnate the man that is now sitting on the throne where he belongs. In his indestructible body. Mm-hmm. 
face to face right now. Everything else falls away. Because God is in breathing who you really are. And this is the rising of the priesthood. There's some of you who feel rather vacant right now. Not sure you're getting it. Not sure you're connecting. Maybe uncertain. What in the world is she talking about? And you're trying to find, locate yourself in the now of God's activity. And if you're feeling like that in any way, I want to give you an opportunity to do something strange. Just lay down where you are. I'm not talking theoretically or spiritually. I'm talking about put your body on the floor. Jacob didn't know that first dark night when he was fleeing for his life with nothing but a promise hanging over him. And the threat of his brother killing him. And the possibility of his father never receiving him back. And a kind of certainty that his mother was going to be suffering as she dealt with the aftermath of the event in his absence. And it was that night as he fell into deep sleep from sheer mental, emotional, physical, psychological exhaustion that God appeared and said the land on which you are lying I'll give it to you When Mahesh and I received an invitation to move to Charlotte, North Carolina 25 years ago, we had no connections there to speak of. I'd only visited there a couple of times. And one of the first events that happened is that a couple who lived in the city invited us to come to their home for dinner fixed a very nice homemade Italian meal to celebrate Mahesh's birthday, which I didn't even know they knew because we weren't intimately acquainted with him. 
And as we were sitting around the table chatting, the father of the house and the two sons and I began to talk about bicycling because they were really into the racing kind of biking. And in the middle of that conversation about bicycles, the husband suddenly said, I have something I want to show you. And he got up and he went to the back of the house. And as he came back to the table, in the action of him putting down before me whatever it was he was going to show me, I suddenly had a very clear picture of myself in our bedroom there in Charlotte, newly moved, taking whatever it was that he was giving me and then lifting up the corner of my mattress of my bed and sticking that thing under my mattress. Clear as you can imagine. I said, this is bizarre. I, I, I looked down and it was a calendar that was the last thing that was produced by the ministry of Jim Baker at PTL in that whole territory. And it was actually produced and sent out from a particular spot, not the water park or any of that. And the calendar was called the Year of Prayer, which was something that already prayer and fasting was deeply established in our lives through Derek, corporate prayer and fasting. And we had brought that, you know, with us as we had come. And so I had the nerve to say to the man, after he told me what it was and showed me himself in that administration when it had existed and told me all about it. And I really wasn't listening to any of the details. I just sort of politely waited and when he finished, and this was a treasure to him. I looked at him and I said, can I borrow this for a while? And he looked at me and went, as long as you promise to give it back to me. Sometimes promises take time. I said, okay. When I got home, as I was walking in my door, I remembered that clear vision. And I went directly to my bedroom, lifted up the mattress and stuck that thing under there. Now mind you, I was not, oh Lord, I claim. I, I had no clue what was happening. I was only doing what I saw in the vision. I will tell you that a couple of years before, when PTL was going through its very publicized humiliation and disaster, I had stood in our living room in Fort Lauderdale watching the news, latest news report, and I had pointed at the television, and I had said concerning that whole region, I wouldn't touch that place with a 10-foot pole. This morning, some of us have said never. One of our good friends, an apostolic minister from Switzerland, was just at our church and ministered to us last Sunday. He said this, the European Union was a noble cause based, birthed out of a trauma. After World War II, a corporate realization that something needed to be done to make the nations one, a noble cause out of a collective, collective trauma is failing because it's a work of the flesh. And it is failing. And this crazy American president that maybe many of you absolutely have to hold your nose is responsible for sparking something 
afresh on the globe that is at the center of the heart of God about the unique individual expression of nations individually. It's a kind of revolt. But it's... And we see it in places like Scotland and Brexit and Switzerland and various where people are saying, wait a minute. We are not supposed to be homogenized into one mass where one new elite will rule us all, taking away our freedoms, our independence. A collective union not based on the Lord can only stabilize and talk and give empathy, but it can never heal. Independence does not mean isolation. Independence is sometimes to find that your identity is contributing to the well-being of others. Because we know who we are and where we came from and under whose name the original covenant was made, we recognize and form our strategic alliances. Father, I pray you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear all that you are speaking to us this morning. Simple enough for a child, we breathe in. So when I got in bed that night after I had put that thing under my mattress, it had been some time and suddenly I'm laying there and the Lord said, get up and get the one year Bible and read the reference for today. Now, it was late at night, so I had to look at the clock and see which side of midnight I was on to know that I would read the right passage. And then I had to go searching through our house through zillions of Bibles to find the one-year Bible, which we hadn't used in years. And I found it. I got back in bed, and I lay down, and I opened it to the right place, and it said, Jacob took a stone for a pillow and he laid down and slept and as he slept he dreamed and there was a ladder and angels upon it ascending and descending and God at the top of the ladder spoke and said the land on which you are lying I will give it to you and Jacob awoke and said ah Surely the Lord is in this place. We're talking about your destiny now in a much greater way than just geography and physicality, but also inclusive of that. We're talking about our saying yes to the there. I will give you my love as a priest of God. Can we say together? Ah, Lord God. Surely, this is the gate of heaven, the house of God. And I didn't realize it till just now. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Receive His name. You are awesome in this place. And all of its function in the anointing. You are worthy of our praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Over 20 years later, our ministry base and our campus is on that spot one that I had said. Priests, I call you to your place. Father, oh, you are 
to you our lives we raise You are awesome in this place As I come into your presence, pass the gates of praise to your sanctuary, to be standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your grace, and I can only bow down. And say, and you are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. Oh, you are worthy of all praise. To you, our lives we raise. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, our Father. Mighty God, you are awesome in this place. Mighty God, you are awesome in this place. Mighty God, let's just sing it one more time. say yes this morning to the responsibility to the responsibility of what it means to be a priest we say yes to the access to 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 the garb to the to the posturing of a priest and we repent for any way that we have tried to avoid <laughs> the responsibility associated with priesthood because it's easier to um, to blame priests for our lack of access <laughs> rather than taking responsibility realizing that we are the priesthood of believers and we've been given access and we've been given new robes of righteousness And so we repent for, for blaming the, the very priesthood, the very place of responsibility, the very place of access that we've been invited to stand. And, and we say yes, Lord. We, we say yes to the invitation 
to move out of the place where it's comfortable to, uh, and to move into the places where we've never been before, to, to go to those places where, where, there is, where there is the lack of governance, where there's the lack of righteousness, where there's, where there's the lack of light. So many times we say it's inconvenient. We say it's too chaotic. We say it's, it's, out, of our, it's out of our wheelhouse. It's out, it's out of our jurisdiction. But the problem is that there's so many places where there is, where there is, where there is no one <laughs> representing the, the, kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so we just say no more excuses. We, we just say it over our stuff. No more, no more excuses. We're willing to step into the inconvenience. We're willing to step into the storm. <laughs> to represent the light, the peace, the joy of heaven, to, to reveal our priest, Christ Jesus. And so we just declare we're not done yet, and we will not prematurely transition. Sometimes, sometimes um, there's a lot that we get excited about empowering the next generation because we don't want to complete the assignment that God has given to us. There's a great place to empower the next generation, but that does not mean that our job is done. It means that we have to begin to run with the next generation. And the, you know, how many know that when Jesus discipled, he didn't just you know, give, give some guys a book and then disappear on them? <laughs> Jesus, like his, his, his method of discipleship is, I will do life with you. I will do ministry with you. I'm not just going to send you a YouTube video and go to heaven on you, you know. We just say yes to the invitation, Father. We say yes to your invitation to step into a new adventure. We know that there's some new adventures that you want to take us on. There's some story, there's some chapters that you want to complete. Too many um, chapters left undone. Too many storylines and narratives. Too many, too many songs left unfinished. We thank you, Father, that you're inviting us back into the place of adventure to bring stories into resolution, into completion, in order to see your justice come, which is that place of shalom, which is that place where the enemy is defeated, into that place where there's reconciliation and relationship. We thank you, Father. You are the great author of Seattle. You are the great author of, uh, of the Pacific Northwest. You're the great author of our families and marriages and children. You are the great author, and we choose, we choose to partner with your authorship. We will be a active part of this royal priesthood rising in this time. Just declare that I will be a part, an active part of this royal priesthood rising in Jesus' name. Everyone in agreement said amen and amen. Thank you, Bonnie. That was amazing. So, so good. What an awesome word. Thank you, Steve. You're amazing too. Awesome. Come on. Have a great lunch uh, afternoon. We'll be back tonight uh, uh, with Papa Mahesh. It's going to be good. Uh, bring some people that don't know Jesus. Bring some people that are demon-possessed. Um, if you're watching online and you have no hope, uh, figure out a way to get here. You're going to want to be in the building tonight. All right. Love you guys. Bless you.